Voting for Major League Baseball's most valuable player uses an interesting system. Baseball writers are asked to list their top 10 choices. Their first choice gets 14 points, second place gets 9, third gets 8, and so on down the road. Then they add up all the scores and the player with the most total points wins. What they don't do is ask writers to choose only one player and then add up all those first place votes. That would be silly as there are really several contenders for the title. In a fractured vote, is the player who only gets first place votes from, say, one-fifth of the writers, but pretty much none of them list that player as number two? Does that player really deserve the title? In college football, they started with a single championship game, then went to a four-team round, and now eight teams are in the mix. This pretty much ensures that the best team in the nation gets to play for the national championship. But in American politics, it's winner-take-all. Whoever gets the most first-place votes wins, no matter how small that winning percentage really is. And when you add in voters who hold their nose and vote for someone they don't really like or don't vote at all because their preferred candidate lost in a primary, it's not a good setup. Shouldn't we have a system where the eventual winner actually got votes from a majority of voters? Some places like Louisiana and New York City have runoffs if the winning candidate doesn't get a high enough percentage of the vote. These are expensive and time-consuming, and then you have to hope that your supporters come out and vote for you again. What if there were a way to do this instantly. There is. It's called ranked choice voting. It's being used in Minneapolis and Maine and a whole lot of other places. And it's the topic for this episode of Progressive Solutions. Ranked choice voting, or RCV, was invented in Europe in the 1850s, then for use in multi-seat races, where there were several winners for each race. By the 1870s, an RCV system had been devised for single-seat races. The first RCV system in the U.S. was adopted in Ashtabula, Ohio in 1915, and other cities soon followed suit. These were all multi-seat races, and through a combination of factors, they were all repealed by 1960, except for Cambridge, Massachusetts. RCV for single-seat races in the U.S. didn't start until San Francisco created one in 2002. Since then, cities and counties in eight different states and the entire state of Maine have adopted RCV. So how does RCV work? Instead of just listing your top choice, you rank the candidates in order of preference. If there are, say, five people running for the same office, you can rank them. You then list your rankings on your ballot. If one candidate is the top choice of a majority of voters, that candidate wins, just like we have now. If not, then some voters' second choice becomes extremely important. The candidate with the fewest votes is dropped from the list, and all the ballots for that candidate are moved to those voters' second choice. If any candidate gets a majority now, that candidate is the winner. If not, another candidate is dropped and those ballots are moved to the next choice, and so on, until a candidate gets a majority of the votes counted. This system has a whole lot of benefits, which I will get to. First, however, there's a lot of opposition to RCV, most of it based either on misinformation or a misunderstanding of how the system works, and I want to get the opposing arguments out of the way. Under this system, you can rank all the candidates, but you don't have to. You could just vote for the top one or top two or whatever. But if you only voted for one candidate, for instance, and that candidate is dropped, then your ballot is also dropped and it won't count in further rounds. Some people say that this is why RCV is no good, because not everybody gets to vote all the way through to the final round. They call this ballot exhaustion, claiming that since some people won't rank all the candidates, too many ballots get dropped before a final decision is made and somebody gets a majority of the rest of the ballots. But here's the thing. Everybody gets a chance to make a full list. If you choose to leave a bunch of candidates off your ballot, well, that's your choice. And everyone who ranks all the candidates will have their ballot counted through every round. In addition, your ballot does count for every candidate you chose to vote for. So your voice was heard. Another claim is that it's too complicated. After all, a ballot that now covers two full pages would have to be expanded to allow for ranked choice voting in every race, and that could get very long. But as this sample ballot from fairvote.org shows, ballots don't have to be that much longer, and they can still be easy to read and easy to use. 
Another argument is that here in America, there's only two major political parties, so there's no need for an RCV system when you only have two choices. In the first place, this argument completely ignores primaries and special elections. In Seattle's 2017 mayoral race, for example, there were 23 candidates on the ballot. And in the California 2003 governor's recall election, there were 135 candidates. In the second place, this argument is trying to lock in our two-party system. There's a lot of extra parties out there, and an RCV system can give them a big boost. Right now, a lot of third-party candidates poll very well early in an election, but their poll numbers drop as voters end up deciding that they need to vote for a candidate who has a chance. With RCV, voters can still choose their minor party candidates as their top choice, confident in the fact that they're not helping the candidate that they really don't like. So much for the complaints. Now, what are the benefits of RCV? First, there are no spoilers. No candidate can ever whine again that some third-party candidate was a spoiler and siphoned off votes that they needed to win and, by the way, didn't earn. Secondly, in hotly contested races, candidates will have to reach out to at least some of their opponent's supporters in hoping to get that number two spot on those ballots. If you alienate a majority of voters, you're not going to win no matter how far ahead you are in the first round. Third, it creates room for minor parties to grow. A party that now gets maybe 1% or 2% of the vote could easily get 4, 5, 6% very quickly. And any party that knows how to take advantage or learns how to take advantage of this situation would be a force to be reckoned with. Coalition building will be a requirement for success. Fourth, there appears to be increased turnout with RCV. So far, it isn't a huge increase because RCV hasn't been used that long in the U.S., but heck, anything that increases voter turnout, worth a try. Finally, more people will believe that their vote, all of their votes, count. And this is very important. A, a government can accomplish a lot more if people believe in it, and RCV is a positive factor in that equation. Now I want to turn to a way that RCV can be used that isn't talked about very much, primarily because a lot of special interests will lose some of their power. With RCV, we don't need primaries. All the candidates can be on the ballot for the general election. Primaries are a strange thing. Technically, they're only a mechanism for political parties to choose their nominees. They're not an election. And yet, taxpayers are footing the bill, especially for the two major political parties. We can save a lot of money by eliminating primaries with RCV. Boards of elections are often overworked and underfunded because, well, they have to run two elections a year, or more if there's a special election or a runoff. With RCV and eliminating primaries, it'll make their jobs that much easier and cut down on errors and other snafus. Running for office also becomes less expensive. Candidates only have to raise money for one cycle rather than two. There would also be a lot less stigma in challenging an incumbent from your own party. The incumbent wouldn't have to raise and spend money to fend off a primary challenge. And with RCV, the challenger wouldn't be siphoning off votes as long as the incumbent can pick those votes up in round two. Voters wouldn't be inundated with campaign mailers and flyers and television ads for quite so long. After all, without a primary, what's the point in knocking on somebody's door in May when they're not voting to November? You're as likely to lose their vote as gain it. So what's the downside? Well, the downside is that the major political parties wouldn't have quite so much power. It's also a lot harder to create a coordinated campaign when you don't have a slate of official nominees. What's worse is that political parties can't play favorites in a crowded field because there's no chance to bring the party together and close ranks behind the nominee. Okay, it's not really a downside, but it does limit the power of political parties, and that's a good thing. Many of our founders, including George Washington, didn't like the idea of political parties, or factions as they called them. Here's what George Washington said in his farewell address. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. Yes, the major political parties would lose power, and that's a good thing. It's also why eliminating primaries probably won't happen anytime soon. 
but at least we can get ranked choice voting passed in cities and states across the country, get people used to that system. Then we can move to the next step by talking about how eliminating primaries saves a lot of tax money. I haven't gone into how RCV works in multi-seat races, and it's a bit more complex, so I'll skim over it quickly. Basically, you still rank your choices, and everyone's top choice is counted. This time, however, instead of needing a majority for election, candidates just need enough votes to guarantee that they're in the top ranks based on how many seats are available. For instance, if there are three seats available, then anyone with more than one-fourth of the votes is elected, as only three candidates could get that many votes. Then the process of eliminating candidates starts until all the seats are filled. Once a ballot is used for a winning candidate, that ballot is then discarded. Every voter gets to help choose one winner. It's a bit more complex than that, but the end result is that an overwhelming majority of voters will have voted for one of the winners. In a three-seat race, for instance, over three-fourths of voters will be guaranteed that their ballot will count for one of the winners. That complexity may be a reason why, over time, multi-seat races went away from RCV. The other reason is that when a political party has a majority in some area, they can generally win all the seats in a multi-seat race under the current system, but they probably wouldn't be able to under RCV. So for now, we should just stick to RCV for single-seat races. It's a lot simpler. Ranked choice voting, like any other reform, isn't a panacea, but it will make things better. It's also important to note that the main argument against it is that it doesn't solve everything by itself. If that's the best opponents can do, it's worth trying. As always, I welcome your comments. What do you think about RCV? Have you ever been involved in one? How did it work out? And of course, what other issues would you like to see here? And if you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button below and also hit the subscribe button and ring that bell so that you'll get notifications of future videos. And also help spread the word. There are plenty of progressive solutions. Thanks for watching. Stay progressive.